My name is Michelle Pereira, and I am the library, the new library director here at the Pasadena Public Library. And I am thrilled to be joining you this morning, and I'm even more thrilled for the event that we have here today. Um, before we get started, I do want to do a little bit of housekeeping. I know you all know where everything is here. You could probably tell us where those things are. But what I want to do is tell you about a few programs that we have coming up. And really the big one is tonight at 7 p.m. at All Saints Church. And we are going to be in conversation with our wonderful author, Viet. So if you're available tonight, 7 p.m., we encourage you to join us. It's not going to be at the Central Library. It's going to be at All Saints Church. Also, we have an event next Thursday evening. It's a community panel. And one of your professors here is actually going to be on that panel. So we would hope that you would come out for that. It's an American War Comes Home, War's Impact on Communities. And forgive me if I mispronounce the name. Florante Peter Ibanez will be on that panel. So we hope you will join us for that. There is an entire lineup in the back if you'd like to pick this up of some great events happening around Pasadena, around one city, one story. So like I said, thank you for entertaining us here today and hosting this author visit. I'm going to, uh, before I turn it over, I do want to give a special thank you to everyone here at PCC, but in particular, um, to a few people who helped make this event possible. That's your librarian here, Catherine McGuire, your dean, Amy Ulmer, and also big special thanks to Ter Leslie Terrapelli. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Amy, and you can take it away. Thank you, Michelle. This is a great turnout, and I'm gonna ask everyone to please turn off their cell phones or anything that makes noise. Um, you can take pictures, but um, keep, keep them silent. So good morning, and welcome to Pasadena City College. We're extremely fortunate today to welcome Pulitzer Prize winning author Viet Thanh Nguyen to speak with us as part of the Pasadena Public Library's One City, One Story program. And this is an annual event. Every year, the city brings in these fabulous authors, and everyone reads the same book. So, do it again next year. Um, PCC's Shatford Library and English Division have always been pleased to partner with Pasadena for this auspicious event. I'd like to thank our Dean of the Library, Leslie Tirapelli, where are you, Leslie, who's back there, and Librarian Catherine McGuire, who's also in the far back, for the work they did to support this program. I think they spent last night blowing up balloons. We are doubly pleased this year as Dr. Wynn will be the keynote speaker at PCC's annual student conference, Borders of Diversity, on May 11th in this very room. That is a conference that is put on by our students. There will be panels of discussion, uh, there will be presentation boards, and then we will have uh, Dr. Wynn. So feel free to return in May to hear more. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Wynn. Born in Vietnam, he came to the United States with his parents as a refugee in 1975, settling first in a camp for Vietnamese refugees in Pennsylvania. Three years later, his parents moved the family to San Jose, California, where they opened one of the first Vietnamese grocery stores in the city at a time when San Jose had not been impacted by the gentrification of Silicon Valley. So it was a bit of a rougher town at that time. Following high school graduation, he attended UC Riverside, UCLA, yes, and eventually graduated from UC Berkeley, going on to receive, yes, going on to receive his doctorate in English and other studies, uh, ethnic studies, excuse me. He moved to Los Angeles to accept a faculty position at USC, and he did that immediately. So he's been at USC for 20 years, which is okay, where he teaches graduates and undergraduates a variety of courses in Asian American studies and literature, war and memory and identity, among others. And along the way, he seems to write a bit. In addition to his novel, The Sympathizer, he is the author of Race and Resistance, Literature and Politics in Asian America, and Nothing Ever Dies, Vietnam and the Memory of War, and the just released short story collection, The Refugees. As if the Pulitzer Prize weren't enough, the Sympathizer has garnered at least a half a dozen other prizes, including the Dayton Lit Literary Peace Prize, 
the first and only annual United States Literary Award recognizing the power of the written word to promote peace. And that, of course, is something we desperately need right now. If you have read The Sympathizer, and I hope you have, you know it is powerful, evocative, and provocative. After Dr. Wynn's talk, we will have a question and answer session, and then he can sign copies of your book, which is conveniently being sold by the bookstore in the back of the room. I know we are in for a wonderful experience, so I ask you to give a warm welcome to Viet Tan Nguyen. Thank you so much for that introduction. Thanks to all of you for being here. Hello, Pasadena City College. It's my first time visiting your great campus. I wish I had a chance to visit before, but now's a good time as any. Um, I always like speaking in front of college students because it reminds me of my own time as a college student at Berkeley and how transformative that was for me because I had grown up in, in San Jose and, oh wait a minute, I totally, totally forgot something here. Forgot, I forgot to do something. This is the most important part. This is the most important part. All right, All right. I'm Asian, I can't help it, okay. <laughs> So I grew up, I grew up Asian, I'm an Asian American, but uh, I grew up in San Jose, and um, even though San Jose was a really diverse city, very multicultural, and I grew up in a neighborhood of Vietnamese refugees and Mexican Americans, I went to school in mostly white schools, and uh, when I was in high school, there were, some of us were, were, were Asian American students, but we didn't know that's what we were. And for lunch, we would congregate in a corner of the campus, a handful of uh, Asian American uh, students that there were, and we would call ourselves the Asian invasion. And in the 1980s, we didn't have the, uh, the, the rhetoric or the language, the terminology to think that maybe we weren't an Asian invasion. Maybe instead we were Asian Americans. And it wasn't until I got to Berkeley and I started taking Asian American studies classes that, I, that a light bulb went off in my head and I thought, wait a minute, it's wrong to call ourselves the Asian invasion. That's racist. And how did that happen? Uh, and so going to Berkeley was really transformative because I started taking these Asian American studies classes and started to understand something about American history. And, and I was so upset because I thought, wait a minute, this happened to Asian immigrants in American history? And the United States excluded Asian Americans, Asian immigrants racially from this country since 1882? There have been racist policies directed against Asians? There was a, a Japanese internment, Japanese American internment that happened? And that was the beginning of my ability to put into words something that had troubled me ever since I came to this country as a refugee in 1975. And that was when I was growing up in Harrisburg and then in San Jose, I was deeply aware of the fact that I was a refugee. I grew up in a Vietnamese refugee community. I obviously lived with Vietnamese people, with my parents. And I grew up surrounded by the stories of Vietnamese people. Uh, that these Vietnamese refugees had all lost something coming to this country. They had lost, they had lost their own country, they had lost their families, they had lost their homes, they had lost their identities, they had lost their prestige. And I knew deeply what had happened to these people. But I also grew up as an American. And I realized when I was growing up in the 1980s and uh, I watched every single movie that Hollywood made about the Vietnam War, which is an exercise I don't recommend to anybody, I realized that when Americans said Vietnam, they meant the Vietnam War. And when they said the Vietnam War, they meant the American War. That is, they meant what that war, they were concerned with what that war did to Americans. And they were not concerned at all about what had happened to the Vietnamese people either the Vietnamese people they fought against or the Vietnamese people who were their allies who had come here to the United States. And so I grew up with these two very different sets of stories, the ones told to me by Vietnamese Americans, Vietnamese refugees, and the ones told by other Americans. And I grew up with this sense that as important as the historical experience was to Vietnamese Americans and Vietnamese refugees, the rest of the country didn't care about that at all. And that was the beginning, that was the moment, th these, this was the moment that, I, that the first idea that I could be a writer was put into my head. Because I thought, someone needs to tell these stories about what had happened to Vietnamese refugees and Vietnamese Americans. And I understood then the importance of storytelling. 
that stories are incredibly important to us. Those of us who grow up in, in a country where we are a part of dominant society take stories for granted. We take for granted that we can go to the movies and, and we can watch movies that are going to tell stories about us, that are going to feature uh, movie stars that look like us, and that when we go to the library and we pick up a book, those stories will be about people like us. But when we are minorities in a society, we can't take that privilege for granted. And we realize that stories are not just stories, right? Stories are really important to telling us who we are and telling us whether or not we belong. And I knew growing up in the United States that I did not belong because the stories about the history that had shaped me did not include me and did not include people like me. And that impressed upon me the absolute urgent importance of becoming a storyteller to transform the kinds of stories that Americans tell about themselves. And this is more than simply writing books or making movies. I think a lot of people, for example, go to watch movies and they think, well, that's just Hollywood. Those are just stories. Those are not important. And it's true. One story, not necessarily that important. But a thousand stories that tell the same story over and over and over again, that's important. So I think about this all the time, about the relationship between the storytelling that I do in writing books, the storytelling that many of you are concerned with when you watch movies, and the storytelling that we're all exposed to as Americans in today's environment. When Donald Trump says, make America great again, he's telling us a story. And it's a story that enough Americans believe in that they voted for him to be president. But that story, make America great again, it's not my story. America was never great for me. But America was great for somebody out there, and so when Donald Trump says, make America great again, he's speaking to those people, but he's not speaking to me. Because he wants to transform American society back into a place and a time that didn't include people like me and didn't tell stories about people like me. And so that was one of the reasons why I wrote The Sympathizer, because I wanted to tell a story, obviously, about the Vietnam War, about the Vietnamese people, about Vietnamese refugees, but I also wanted to tell a story that challenged our American story, that challenged the idea that for Vietnamese people, America was great, because for many Vietnamese people, America was not great. So storytelling is really, really crucial, and I wanted to share some of the stories from The Sympathizer with you and tell you a little bit about, um, about my intentions behind those, these, these scenes and their relevance for us today. So uh, The Sympathizer is about a communist spy in the South Vietnamese army who, whose task in April of 1975 when Saigon falls or is about to be liberated, depending on your point of view, is to flee with the remnants of that army to the United States and spy on their efforts to take their country back. And all of these things really did happen. When I was growing up in San Jose in the 1980s and I would go to the debt celebrations, the Lunar New Year celebrations, there would be men, South Vietnamese men, wearing military uniforms. And there would be a table there showing pictures of men wearing fatigues and carrying weapons in the Thai jungle preparing to try to take South uh, Vietnam back. And the purpose of having that table there was to raise money to fund that revolution. And so that was the seed of the idea for what takes place in The Sympathizer. So our, our, our narrator comes to Southern California in 1975 and he is put into a refugee camp. All the refugees who came to this country in 1975 ended up in one of four refugee camps. I ended up in Fort Indian Town Gap in Pennsylvania. He ends up in Camp Pendleton in San Diego. And so this is where the first scene takes place. He's writing a letter to his aunt in Paris telling her what life is like for these refugees in Camp Pendleton. If allowed to stay together, I told my aunt, we could have incorporated ourselves into a respectably sized, self-sufficient colony, a pimple on the buttocks of the American body politic. That's supposed to be a joke. <laughs> Sufficiently collective to elect our own representative to the Congress and have a voice in our America. A little Saigon as delightful, delirious, and dysfunctional as the original, which was exactly why we were not allowed to stay together, but were instead dispersed by bureaucratic fiat. Wherever we found ourselves, we found each other. 
We did our best to conjure up the culinary staples of our culture, but since we were dependent on Chinese markets, our food had an unacceptably Chinese tinge. Another blow in the gauntlet of our humiliation that left us with a sweet and sour taste of unreliable memories. Just correct enough to evoke the past, just wrong enough to remind us that the past was forever gone. Missing, along with the proper variety, subtlety, and complexity of our universal solvent, fish sauce. Oh, fish sauce, how we missed it. How nothing tasted right without it. This pungent liquid condiment of the darkest sepia hue was much denigrated by foreigners for its supposedly horrendous reek, lending new meaning to the phrase, there's something fishy around here, for we were the fishy ones. We used fish sauce the way Transylvanian villagers wore cloves of garlic to ward off vampires. In our case, to establish a perimeter with those Westerners who could never understand that what was truly fishy was the nauseating stench of cheese. What was fermented fish compared to curdled milk? But out of deference to our hosts, we kept our feelings to ourselves, sitting close to one another on prickly sofas and scratchy carpets, our knees touching under crowded kitchen tables chewing on dried squid and the cut of remembrance until our jaws ached, trading stories heard second and third hand about our scattered countrymen. This was the way we learned of the clan turned into slave labor by a farmer in Modesto, and the naive girl who flew to Spokane to marry her GI sweetheart and was sold to a brothel, and the widower with nine children who went out into a Minnesota winter and lay down in the snow on his back with mouth open until he was buried and frozen and the regretful refugees on Guam who petitioned to go back to Vietnam, never to be heard from again. And the spoiled girl seduced by heroin who disappeared into the Baltimore streets, and the devout Buddhist who spanked his young son and was arrested for child abuse in Houston, and the husband who slapped his wife and was jailed for domestic violence in Raleigh, and the men who had escaped but left wives behind in the chaos, and the women who had escaped but left husbands behind, and the children who had escaped without parents and grandparents, and the family is missing one, two, three, or more children. Sifting through the dirt, we pan for gold. The story of the baby orphan adopted by a Kansas billionaire, or the mechanic who bought a lottery ticket in Arlington and became a multimillionaire, or the girl elected president of her high school class in Baton Rouge, or the boy accepted by Harvard from Fond du Lac, the soil of Camp Pendleton still in the tracks of his sneakers, or the movie star you love so much, dear aunt, who circled the world from airport to airport, no country letting her in after the fall of Saigon, none of her American movie star friends returning her desperate phone calls until, with her last dime, she snagged Tippi Hedren, who flew her to Hollywood. So it was that we soaked ourselves in sadness and we rinsed ourselves with hope. And for all that we believed, almost every rumor we heard, almost none of us, almost all of us refused to believe that our nation was dead. So the Tippi Hedren story is true. The movie star was Kyo Jin, who was the most famous movie star of her time in the Vietnam in the 1960s and 1970s. And a little footnote to this history, Tippi Hedren was so moved by the experience of these Vietnamese refugees that she had her personal manicurist train some of these Vietnamese women in the arts of manicuring. And that is how, 40 years later, the Vietnamese have come to take over 51% of the nail salon industry in this country. <laughs> Which is either a pro-refugee story or an anti-refugee story, depending on your point of view, right? But, um, you know, I, 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 I talked about this scene with you because refugees are still with us today. Right? We are still, we've actually never been in a moment in history in the last 50 or 60 years where there hasn't been a refugee crisis happening somewhere in this world, and now we're living at a time where there are 65 million people stateless in this world. But uh, they, if put together into one country, they would be the 24th largest country in the world. And as a, as a refugee myself, I feel that it's, it's important to draw attention to stories like these, uh, to, to, to draw attention to the fact that refugees have been forcibly displaced from their, pla from their countries and that they have come um, seeking help. And at this moment in our history, we've become a country that has closed the door or is trying to close the door on refugees. And if this country had closed the door on me, I wouldn't be here today. 
I wouldn't have won the Pulitzer Prize, right? So um, not that every refugee has to win the Pulitzer Prize. That's not the point. The point is, is that we have moral obligations to refugees, and oftentimes we have political obligations to refugees. The United States took in Southeast, uh, over a million Southeast Asian, uh, Southeast Asian refugees because of the war that the United States had fought in Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. And even though today perhaps we think we don't owe anything to Syrians and Muslims, if we think about how our foreign policy has helped to disrupt their countries and to create conditions of war, maybe we do have political as well as moral obligations to the new refugees seeking uh, aid from us. So one of the things that my narrator, my protagonist, has to do after coming to this country is to get a job. <clears throat> and the job that he gets, one of the jobs that he gets, is to become the authenticity consultant on the making of a movie that looks suspiciously like Apocalypse Now. Um, if you read the acknowledgments, it's obvious, because I've read every single book that's been published about Francis Ford Coppola and Apocalypse Now. But the movie that's going to be talked about in this next sequence is actually a compendium of, again, all those war movies that Hollywood made about the Vietnam War. And in this scene, our protagonist goes to meet the director of this movie, who's known only as the auteur. My meeting with the auteur had gone on for a while longer, mostly in a more subdued fashion, with me pointing out that the lack of speaking parts for Vietnamese people in a movie set in Vietnam might be interpreted as cultural insensitivity. Do you not think it would be a little more believable, I said, a little more realistic, a little more authentic for a movie set in a certain country, for the people in that country to have something to say? Instead of having your screenplay direct as it does now, cut to villagers speaking in their own language. Do you think it might not be decent to let them actually say something? instead of simply acknowledging that there is some kind of sound coming from their mouths? Could you not even just have them speak a heavily accented English? You know what I mean, ching chong English? Just to pretend they are speaking in an Asian language that somehow American audiences can strangely understand? The auteur grimaced and said, very interesting, great stuff, loved it. But I had a question. What was it? Oh, yes. How many movies have you made? None. Isn't that right? None. Zero. Zilch. Nada. Nothing. And however you say it in your language. So thank you for telling me how to do my job. Now get the hell out of my house and come back after you've made a movie or two. Maybe then I'll listen to one or two of your cheap ideas. I've had the opportunity to meet quite a few Hollywood people in the last year or two, and none of them dispute this characterization. <laughs> I confess to being angry with the auteur, but was I wrong in being angry? This was especially the case when he acknowledged he did not even know that Montagnard was simply a French catch-all term for the dozens of Highland minorities. The movie's called The Hamlet, and it's about American Green Berets who have gone into this Highland village to help defend and protect these Highland people from the Viet Cong. What if, I said to him, I wrote a screenplay about the American West and simply called all the natives Indians. You'd want to know whether the cavalry was fighting the Navajo or Apache or Comanche, right? Likewise. I would want to know, when you say these people are Montagnards, whether we speak of the Brew, or the Nung, or the Tay. Let me tell you a secret, the auteur said. You ready? Here it is. No one gives a shit. He was amused by my wordlessness. To see me without words is like seeing one of those Egyptian felines without hair, a rare and not necessarily desirable occasion. How could I be so dense? How could I be so deluded? I naively believed that I could divert the Hollywood organism from its goal, the simultaneous lobotomization and pickpocketing of the world's audiences. 
Hollywood did not just make horror movie monsters, horror movie monsters, it was its own horror movie monster smashing me under its foot. I had failed, and the auteur would make the Hamlet as he intended, with my countrymen serving merely as raw material for an epic about white men saving good yellow people from bad yellow people. I pitied the French for their naivete in believing they had to visit a country in order to exploit it. Hollywood was much more efficient, imagining the countries it wanted to exploit. I was maddened by my helplessness before the auteur's imagination and machinations. His arrogance marked something new in the world, for this was the first war where the losers would write history instead of the victors, courtesy of the most efficient propaganda machine ever created with all due respect to Joseph Goebbels and the Nazis who never achieved global domination. Hollywood's high priest understood innately the observation of Milton Satan, that it was better to rule in hell than serve in heaven. Better to be villain, loser, or anti-hero than virtuous extra, so long as one commanded the bright lights of center stage. In this forthcoming Hollywood trompe all the Vietnamese of any side would come out poorly, herded into the roles of the poor, the innocent, the evil, or the corrupt. Our fate was not to be merely mute. We were to be struck dumb. So in that scene, I wanted to get to one of the central paradoxes of Hollywood's Vietnam War movie genre, which is that if you watch these movies, most of them depict American soldiers in a negative light. The American soldiers, for example, go out there and rape and murder Vietnamese people. So, this would seem to be a bad thing. Isn't it anti-American to show American soldiers doing these kinds of terrible things? And the paradox is that it's not. Because it's much better, as that scene just talked to you about, to be the anti-hero so long as you're the star. It's better to be that versus the virtuous person whose only role in the movie is to stand there in the background and be silent until they're killed, which is what happens to Vietnamese people. So that's the central paradox of American movie making, that the way that Hollywood has coped with this traumatic episode of American history is by putting Americans at the center of that traumatic history and putting the Vietnamese into the margins. And in this novel, I wanted to do the reverse. I wanted to put the Vietnamese people in the center of their own story, which is important given that three million Vietnamese people died versus 58,000 Americans. And I didn't want to turn my protagonist into that virtuous extra, the saint, the good person. I wanted my protagonist to be as anti-heroic as those American soldiers in those movies. Because I'm, I'm sure that all of you have seen movies about gangsters and hitmen and villains as the stars and that doesn't make you like those people any less. In fact, it's oftentimes more compelling to watch a movie about a hitman, right? Because we are interested in evil and villainy. That's compelling. And so the protagonist of my novel is a liar, a traitor, a spy, an alcoholic, and a womanizer. Obviously not autobiographical. Right? <laughs> if it was autobiographical, it'd be a really boring book. So the point is for the novel to claim center stage for Vietnamese people, but also to claim the prerogatives of complexity, of subjecthood, of being both the hero and the anti-hero at the same time. All right, so I'm going to end with a final scene, um, and then we'll move on to hopefully a discussion with all of you, which is always my favorite part. And this scene is about another interesting episode in Vietnamese American history, which is that when these, southern, when these Vietnamese refugees came to this country in 1975, uh, one of the first things that they did was to open a nightclub. If you know anything about Vietnamese people, you know we like to sing, dance, drink, and smoke. And nothing changed, even though we were refugees. So 1975, they opened this nightclub in LA, and this is the genesis for what has become something called Paris by Night. I don't know how many of you have heard of Paris by Night. It's a few. Paris by Night is, is, is Vietnamese, Vietnamese America's Hollywood. 
It's in about 120 episodes right now. It's a song and dance review. It's, a, it's actually quite spectacular. Shot in places like Paris or Las Vegas. It's the place for Vietnamese singers and dancers to come together and stage this big review. And it's watched all over the world in the Vietnamese diaspora. And through the 1980s and 1990s, it was actually a better production than anything the Vietnamese people in Vietnam could produce for themselves. And so these tapes would be smuggled back in to the black market, black market economy. And so this episode, in this episode, the protagonist goes to this nightclub and he encounters the one woman who he should not fall in love with, the daughter of his boss, the general. Now known by just one name, like John, Paul, George, Ringo, and Mary. I'm not even sure if that joke works here. I'm not even sure if you guys even know who John, Paul, George, and Ringo are. <laughs> They're the Beatles, okay? Um, anyway, Lana stepped on stage clad in a red velvet bustier, a leopard print miniskirt, black lace gloves, and thigh-high leather boots with stiletto heels. My heart would have paused at the boots, the heels, or the flat, smooth slice of her belly, naked in between miniskirt and bustier. But the combination of all three arrested my heart altogether and beat it with the vigor of a Los Angeles police squad. <laughs> Too close to reality, huh? Yeah. Pouring yeah. cognac over my heart freed it, but thus drenched, it was easily flambéed by her torch song. She turned on the heat with her first number, the unexpected, I'd love you to want me, which I had heard before sung only by men. I'd love you to want me was the theme song of the bachelors and unhappily married males of my generation, whether in the English or original or the equally superb French and Vietnamese renditions. What the song expressed so perfectly from lyric to melody was unrequited love. And we men of the South love nothing more than unrequited love. Cracked hearts are primary weakness after cigarettes, coffee, and cognac. Listening to Lana sing, all I wanted was to immolate myself in a night with her to remember forever and ever. Every man in the room shared my emotion as we watched her do no more than sway at the microphone, her voice enough to still the audience, and her voice enough to move the audience, or rather, to still us. Nobody talked and nobody stirred except to raise a cigarette or a glass. An utter concentration, not broken for a next slightly more upbeat number, bang, bang, my baby shot me down. Lana's version of bang, bang layered English with French and Vietnamese. The last line of the French version echoed Pham Zui's Vietnamese version, we will never forget. In the pantheon of classic pop songs from Saigon, this tricolor rendition was one of the most memorable masterfully weaving together love and violence in the enigmatic story of two lovers who, regardless of having known each other since childhood, or because of knowing each other since childhood, shoot each other down. Bang, bang was the sound of memory's pistol firing into our heads, for we could not forget love. We could not forget war. We could not forget lovers. We could not forget enemies. We could not forget home. And we could not forget Saigon. We could not forget the caramel flavor of iced coffee with coarse sugar, the bowls of noodle soup eaten while squatting on the sidewalk, the strumming of a friend's guitar while we swayed on hammocks under coconut trees, the whisper of a dewy lover saying the most seductive words in our language, an ai, the working men who slept in their seclos on the streets, kept warm only by the memories of their families, the refugees who slept on every sidewalk of every city, the sweetness and firmness of a mango plucked fresh from its tree, the girls who refused to talk to us and who we only pine for more, the men who had died or disappeared, the streets and homes blown away by bombshells, the streams where we swam naked and laughing, the secret grove where we spied on the nymphs who bathed and splashed with the innocence of the birds, the shadows cast by candlelight on the walls of wattled huts, the barking of a hungry dog in an abandoned village, the appetizing reek of the fresh durian one wept to eat, the sight and sound of orphans howling by the dead bodies of their mothers and fathers, the stickiness of one's shirt 
by afternoon, the stickiness of one's lover by the end of lovemaking, the stickiness of our situations. And while the list could go on and on and on, the point was simply this. The most important thing we could never forget was that we could never forget. Thank you. So I would love to take questions from you or comments. Yes, in the front. So the, did everybody hear the question? No, the question was the, um, the, my protagonist makes efforts to get rid of his accent and speak perfect English, and did I have any of those experiences? No, you know, because I came when I was four, and uh, I obviously didn't speak English at the time, and I actually don't know how I learned how to speak English and read English. I was too young, and when you're at that age, I think you, you naturally are able to acquire another language. But, what was obvious to me growing up was that the expectation of other Americans was that someone who was Asian would not speak perfect English, right? Uh, you know, one of the, to, be, to be a minority in this country means that you are burdened with a particular set of racial stereotypes, and each minority has its own unique set of stereotypes. And that's the stereotype, for, one of the stereotypes for, for Asians. We don't speak good English because we can't possibly belong here because we're foreigners, even if we've been here many, many generations. And so it's a common, obviously a common question that many Asian Americans or Asian immigrant, immigrants get. Where do you come from? And, and uh, they mean that by, people mean by that question usually, where do you really come from? And if you speak good English, oftentimes, uh, maybe less, less so now and less so in California, but many Asian Americans have recounted the, the experience of being complimented for their perfect English, even if they were born here, right? So I knew that that was the stereotype and the challenge facing me as I grew up. And uh, I didn't have a problem with that as a person because I did speak perfect English. But when I became a writer or when I was trying to become a writer, I knew that that was the burden of stereotype and expectation that I was working against. And I knew that uh, there wasn't a large tradition, a long tradition of Asian Americans writing in English in this country and that we weren't expected to write American literature. So for me, the challenge was not to perfect an accent. For me, the challenge was to prove indisputably that I could write as well as anybody else in the English language, and that this was going to be my claim to America. Going back to the, you know, what I said at the beginning, that storytelling is so important to laying claim to American identity. You know, we tell stories to demonstrate that we are Americans. We tell stories to transform the American story. And obviously, that was what I was going to do. And the way to do that was not simply through the content of the story. You don't actually prove that you belong to the United States because of the content of your stories. You prove you belong by demonstrating that you speak perfect English, that you write perfect English. Language is crucial to identity. And that was what I was going to prove through the novel. Thank you. In the back. exceed all our expectations. We are very honored to have you here today. Thank you. But I do have a question for you. And you know, first of all, I just want to comment that you fe you seem too young to have written this book. You really, really do. I'd live I'm a lot some... older than I look, no, by the way. No, yeah. sir. I, I, I remember this, and I don't know how you know this. But my question is, how was this book received in the Vietnamese American community? Um, well, you know, the book has not been translated into Vietnamese yet, and that's a whole separate question. But um, you know, some people in the Vietnamese American community have read this book, and the response has been actually almost wholly positive, I think. And that's sort of a self-selection process, because if you can read English, then you're more assimilated, right? Um, but I'm surprised by how many people from an older generation who actually lived through this history, remember this history, have told me that it captures this time period, captures Saigon of this moment, captures 
the fall of Saigon. The first 50 pages of the novel is all about the fall of Saigon, you know. And how I did that was to read every book that was available about the fall of Saigon so that I could map out those, that time period, week by week, day by day, hour by hour, and then literally minute by minute by the end. Um, and then, of course, there's a lot, because I was listening to all of these stories that Vietnamese people were telling, uh, when I, telling me when I was growing up, and because I did a lot of reading about the Vietnam War and about this time period, all those details uh, make their way into the book. And that affects the way that the older generation thinks that this is an accurate representation of this time period. But interestingly, the younger generation, people who grew up like me um, with no memory of the past, have said to me that sometimes it's really difficult for them to read this book because it brings up emotions that they, they, they don't want to deal with. It's not that they remember what happened, but they remember their parents remembering what happened. And so when your parents have suffered something traumatic, that trauma is oftentimes passed on to you either because your parents tell you explicitly about the trauma or because your parents don't tell you and they act out in other ways like domestic violence or because your parents don't say anything at all and you grow up aware that the silences mean something. What your parents don't say means something. And so it's been moving for me to see that uh, people who um, did not live, do not remember this time period have also been moved by the book as well. Thanks. Yes, in the front. Can you speak uh, for a minute on the difference between, or the distinction between refugee and immigrant? The distinction between refugee and immigrant. So when The Sympathizer came out, um, there were a lot of reviews that described it as an immigrant novel and called me an immigrant writer. And I've been, I've had, I, I had to write articles and, and continually say over and over again, no, I am not an immigrant. I'm a refugee, and this is not an immigrant novel, it's a war novel, and these distinctions are really important. And the reason why people automatically reach for that immigrant classification is because immigrants are a part of the American dream. Now, we're living at a time period in American history where, that, where the, 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 the door seems to be closing on immigration. Those of you who think that, that, that when the Trump administration says, we're only gonna ban refugees, and we're only gonna ban undocumented immigrants or what they call illegals, you have it completely wrong. This is, these are simply the first steps towards closing the door on immigration as a whole. Because what has happened in this country is that we are not just a country of immigrants. Immigrants are not just a part of the American dream, but through a considerable portion of American history, we have been a racially exclusionary society that has outlawed people from non-white countries to come in here. From 1882 to 1965, for, for that time period, most non-white immigration was not allowed into this country. So the desire to shut the door now is a desire to return us back to the period before 1965 when non-white people were not allowed to come in here. So even though the United States has a troubled relationship with immigrants, there is still part of the American mythology that depends on immigration and on immigrants. So when new people like me come in, we're classified as immigrants because we're then assimilable. We're then understandable. Refugees are different altogether. Refugees are people who are unwanted where they come from and unwanted where they go to. And they bring with them the, the, the perception of contamination. We're afraid of refugees, and when I say we, it's not just Americans, Europeans too, other countries too. We're afraid of refugees because we think they'll bring disease and filth and uh, strange religions and strange foods and vice. And so we don't want to include them here. And we're also afraid of refugees because we're afraid that we'll become refugees too. Refugees bring with them the reminder that we're really only one catastrophe away from becoming refugees ourselves. Natural disaster, nuclear war, that could happen in the United States. We don't want to think about that. And as a matter of fact, the, in the United States, I'll give you an example. When Hurricane Katrina happened and all those thousands of displaced people were out on the streets and in the flooded flood zones and the ref, some of the media started calling these people refugees, President George Bush said, it's un-American to call Americans refugees. And Jesse Jackson, for perhaps the only time ever that he agreed with George Bush, said, it's racist to call African Americans refugees. In other words, Americans deeply believe that they cannot be refugees. 
which is why it's so crucial to keep talking about refugees in this country and for me to keep saying that I'm a refugee as well, right? Because uh, as assimilated as I've become, you know, I've, basically if you look at me, I've made the transition from refugee to bourgeoisie, right? From camps to clubs. I get invited to all kinds of clubs that I would never have been invited to 40 years ago. Um, so it's important for me to say no. Some part of me always remains a refugee, right? Uh, because it made me into the person that I am and into the person that could write a novel like this. Yes, in the, in the, in the front. Um, my question is, two questions. Number one, um, I remember vividly a movie in the 80s called The Killing Fields. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. I remember uh, in the 80s this movie called The Killing Fields. Um, and uh, it's kind of an unusual structure because uh, it follows Americans, of course. And then it follows a, a Vietnamese character. Cambodian. Pardon me, yeah. pardon me. Yeah. An eight, uh, an, uh, Southeast Asian character, yeah. Cambodian, yeah. Uh, for a good part of the half of the film toward the back. And it, for me, I was terribly moved by it. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought uh, it really captured something very specific. So uh, again, I'd love to hear your reaction to that if you had saw it when you were a child. And number two, can you speak about your awakening to, I don't want to say your non-assimilation, but your awakening to not just trying to fit in, but your awakening to I have an identity that is hyphenated. I have a, I have a part of my culture, my upbringing that I don't have to hide, that I want to actually talk about and bring to the table. Mm -hmm. As a child, do you remember, or can you speak to about that transition for you? Well, I think those questions are both related. Thank you. Yeah, uh, because you know, The Killing Field is about the, the Cambodian genocide. You know, um, and it's a movie about rescue, right? That the, 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 the Cambodian protagonist survives the killing fields and then he manages to get out, get out. and he's uh, you know, rescued by his, by his American friend who he had worked for. And that's, that's, that's such a, a well-known movie that if you go to Cambodia and you go to a hotel room, like as, as I did a few years ago, there are copies of the killing fields there as part of your education about Cambodia, right? And it's a very powerful moving movie. Um, but it also participates in a, a, a really strong, dominant American version of storytelling, which you've all been exposed to, which is the narrative of Americans rescuing other people. You know, that's, that's what I cited that in, in, in the passage that I read. You know, Hollywood makes movies about white men saving good yellow people from bad yellow people. That is a classic American narrative. Substitute other colors, black people, brown people, red people, whatever. There's good guys and bad guys. We're on the side of the good guys. In this case, it was the poor Cambodian survivor and against the bad guys, the Khmer Rouge, right? And so that narrative is really important to Americans because it casts Americans in the role of the rescuers. Even if, in the case of Cambodia, the United States actually destroyed the country through mass carpet bombing. Conveniently forgotten for the most part, in, in this narrative. And it puts people like me, the Southeast Asian, into the position of being the person who's grateful for being rescued, which makes it really, really hard to bring up the fact that your country is carpet bombed. It seems ungrateful to bring up that fact, you know? That's a really difficult narrative to get out of because it's so persuasive and it's so powerful. And so for, you know, I, I receive handfuls of hate mail sometimes and the most common refrain is, um, you are so ungrateful. America saved you and rescued you. How can you write this anti-American novel? One response is, this novel is just not anti-American. It's anti-Vietnamese, too. It offends everybody, right? But if, you're, if you focus on the fact that you're offended and you forget how everyone else is offended, then you think it's just about you. But that's how deeply, how strong that narrative of American gratitude is. Americans expect the people who come here as immigrants or refugees to be grateful. And they forget the fact that a lot of people are here in this country because the United States fought wars in their countries to begin with. Very contradictory part of history. And that's what I wanted to confront in The Sympathizer. So when I was growing up, to answer the second part of your question, I did know I was hyphenated. I did know I, I was, but, but no, I, I knew that I was different. I didn't know that I was hyphenated. That's a crucial distinction. I knew that I was not American in the way that people in Hollywood movies were Americans. And that's why when I was in high school, I knew that I was not white like most of my classmates, but I didn't know what to call myself. I could call myself Vietnamese, but there was no hyphenated identity. There was no Vietnamese American, and there was no Asian American. That's why we had to resort to Asian invasion. We were so uh, colonized by Hollywood 
that the, our only recourse was to call ourselves by a racist stereotype. Hopefully times are better for you guys. Hopefully things have changed for the better. Because people have fought politically to change those terms and have fought to change the way that stories are told here in this country. And that's what I wanted to do with The Sympathizer. I wanted to, I thought I started, I thought I wanted to write about hyphenated identity, Vietnamese American, Asian American, and that's, that was the start of it. That started in college. But I also realized that that's what's not gonna be enough because it's too easy to take the hyphenated identity, whatever you happen to be, and fit it into the immigrant story and fit it into the story of being rescued by America. And I refuse to do that. This novel is instead a very angry novel. Hopefully it's a funny novel too, I don't know, but it's definitely a very angry novel. And it's an angry novel because it wants to point out that this narrative of rescue is not sufficient. And it's an angry novel because I looked at um, the fact that we do have a lot of Asian American literature now, and the place of Asian Americans in this society is to be the model minority. We're supposed to be grateful, we're supposed to be quiet, we're supposed to study hard, our only threat to this, to this country is that we break the curve and we take up too many college admission spots. That's our threat, you know. But we're supposed to be good. And this novel is not about being good. This is not the quiet Asian American story. This is a story that's angry because it says, we're here because you were there. We're not just here because we're immigrants, we're here because we're refugees. This is not an immigrant novel, it's a war novel because it shows how the United States fought a war somewhere and created the conditions for bringing people here in the first place. So in the back. In that, and I'm curious how you incorporate capitalism and classism into that, because those two kind of go hand in hand, and that's what your um, passage that you read made me think of. Um, so that's my question: is how do you think that incorporates with that? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, um, in my nonfiction work, Nothing Ever Dies, I talk about industries of memory, that Hollywood is an industry of memory. And that's important because it's important to think about stories not just in terms of what you see on the screen or what you see on the page. You're just the consumer of an end product there. What's really cru also really crucial is not just the image or the story, the end product. What's also really crucial is the entire industry that delivers that product to you. Hollywood is an incredibly unequal industry and an incredibly white industry, right? That's a part of that version of capitalism. And so the fact that you don't see images of Asian Americans, for example, in a lot of Hollywood movies or TV is a direct consequence of the fact that Asian Americans are structurally excluded from this industry of memory. And so that the capitalism that's being practiced is a, is a racist capitalism. If the literary industry, this other in industry, is 87% white. It's hard to say that this race is not a factor in that. Right? So as a scholar, I could talk about that very explicitly and nothing ever dies. As a, as a novelist and as an entertainer, I have to figure out a different way to talk about it in the novel. And so the fact that my, co my, my protagonist is a communist spy means that he's probably read Marxist theory and that he can therefore engage in a critique of capitalism. So it's within the boundaries of, of reality that this novel could actually bring forth a Marxist critique of the entertainment industry and also a, 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 an anti-racist critique of the Hollywood entertainment industry as well. So that was really important for me in writing this novel was to come up with a protagonist who could reasonably say some very critical things. So that would mean that the novel wouldn't seem as if it was just me dropping a bunch of lectures into the book. Yes. of what nothing means in, in that sense and, and if it has to do with that every movement, every, every dogma, everything basically gets down to at the end to human nature when it gets involved in that. Um, so I would love to hear you talk about what nothing means there. Right, uh, for those of you who haven't made it to the end of the novel, the entire ending of the novel revolves around the word nothing and the dual meanings of nothing. 
Um, and it's the duality of nothing that's really, really important, right? Because I think we, when we hear the word nothing, we only think of it as a negative term. There's nothing there, a blank space. But the novel says that nothing can actually be a presence, just like zero can be a presence too, right? And the duality is really crucial because it's based on a joke in the novel. Nothing is more precious than independence and freedom. This is a slogan that the North Vietnamese used to mobilize themselves and, and, and fight this horrible, horrible war. And like all slogans, it's a dangerous, dangerous thing. All slogans, I think what I say in the novel, are empty suits draped on the corpse of an idea. They're used to get people to, to rally around the flag, you know, to follow blindly their leaders. Every country has its own version of this slogan, and nothing is more precious than independence and freedom was that version for the North Vietnamese. And so my protagonist has to be able to learn how to see past the slogan. For most of us, it's really hard to see past the slogan. When we hear, make America great again, half this country is saying, yeah, that's awesome. And I'm a part of the half of the country that thinks, wait a minute, again, like I said, this country was never great for me or for people like me. Right? So he has to see past the ideology. He has to see the fact that nothing is actually a presence. Nothing is actually more important than independence and freedom in, post -com in communist Vietnam. That communist Vietnam fought this horrible war for independence and freedom, and then ironically, after the war, it made independence and freedom less than nothing in a totalitarian society. So that's the joke in the novel, but the thing that you're getting at, this idea of the universal truth, is something that I'm still trying to figure out myself, um, that nothing uh, actually has spiritual possibilities. We're all confronted by nothing. When we die, we're all looking at nothing. What does that mean? That's why we turn to religion, to help us make sense out of nothing. But perhaps nothing is all there is. And that's not, that's not supposed to be a negative, that's, like I said, it could be a positive. Buddhism confronts this issue of nothingness as a positive presence. I'm not a Buddhist, so that's why I don't know what I'm talking about, okay? <laughs> that's why there has to be a sequel, so I can try to figure out what I really meant by putting nothing at the end of the novel. So we're gonna have nothing more questions, so we'll have okay. time for you to sign okay. Thank you so much.